This is part three of chapter six, learning. All right, so let's take a look at prejudice. We all have and possess some form of prejudice. However, in our everyday life, when we're talking about operant conditioning, operant conditioning allows us to know how it can permeate and continue even now and how it can actually take foot and shape hold to the point where people are being hurt because of the prejudice. So what does <clears throat> prejudice do? It gives attention and approval from others that's thinking on that line and thinking egocentrically. It increases their self-esteem at the expense of others. It generalizes a negative experience with a specific group and then it's branching it out to all members of that particular group. And then this turns into a racist form of behavior that's reinforced on an intermittent type schedule. And remember with the intermittent, what I mentioned about it being highly resistant to extinction. Therefore, racism is difficult for it to be released due to some of these factors that we just discussed. Now, we attempt to work with and help to control our involuntary bodily responses, but we try to use what we call biofeedback um, or, uh, to help in terms of getting control of different situations. Not per se the prejudice or racism, but allowing us to have control of other everyday situations in our life. That comes with uh, biofeedback training. And pretty much what we use are uh, things like our blood pressure, our body temperature, muscle tension, um, and it can be recorded electronically. This information would then be amplified and reported back to a client or a patient to help them in terms of using headphones, signal lights, or other means. One form of bio, uh, biofeedback technique I used to use with my clients is allowing them to know when they're calm based upon the palm of their hand. The colder your hand is in the palm of your hand, the more tense and stressed you actually might be. So the goal would be is through just either meditation or doing some visual type of activities um, to allow them to take themselves to a place uh, that was away from a stressful moment. When they can start feeling their hands warming up, then it allows them to know that they were calming down, that they were becoming more relaxed. The more relaxed they would be, the uh, warmer their hand would be, and actually the redder. It's like right now, my hand is kind of on the cool side. So that means I need to woo side for a minute. But that would be one technique that you would help use. So what happens is though the information that we do, it helps the person start to learn how to control their bodily processes. Hence it allows them to become more calm, cool, and collected and re-establish homeostasis within themselves. Now talk about side effects of punishment. And everybody has their own theory in regards to how punishment should be and occur. But when we're talking about punishment, um, passive aggressiveness for a person, um, um, the punishment can lead to frustration, to anger, and eventually it can also lead to aggression. So passive aggressiveness is something that we look at. But most of us have been able to learn from experience, okay? And that retaliatory type of aggression toward a punisher, especially one who's bigger or more powerful than you, is kind of followed up more with the punishment. So therefore, we tend to try to control our actions or our impulse in open aggression. And instead, we'll resort to more subtle techniques like showing up late or avoiding um, <laughs> avoiding the situation for getting mail or letters and that's kind of known as that uh, passive aggressiveness as well the avoidance behavior no one likes to be punished so you kind of naturally will try to avoid the punisher so every time you come home from, from um, home to your mom or dad or uh, even if you're married 
and your spouse or they're yelling at you, you know, kind of delay coming home and try to find somewhere else to be. Inappropriate modeling. This is when you're, um, you know, well, have you ever seen a parent spank or hit the child for hitting another child? <laughs> Ironically, this is this is that type of punishing um, that's unintentionally going to serve as a model for the type of behavior they're trying to have that child stop in the first place um, because they're doing it to them. So, temporary suppression is uh, versus elimination. Here we're talking about how punishment is generally going to suppress the behavior only momentarily while the punisher is nearby. Then there's learned helplessness. So why do some people stay in abusive relationships? Research shows that it's been, it's been because repeatedly failed your attempts to control your environment. You start to acquire a general sense of powerlessness or learned helplessness. And then you start to make no further attempts to make any changes or trying to escape the situation. Now there's also what we call rewarded aggression. And that's because punishment often is going to produce a decrease in an undesired behavior. So at least for the moment, the punisher is in effect rewarded for applying punishment. Then you have what we call perpetuated aggression. Go back. All right, well, neither says to say I've got thrown off, so please make sure you finish reading on that section if you have any questions about the forms of aggression please do send me a message but I'll just keep moving forward this is a slide that you'll probably be doing for your assignment so the only thing I'm gonna say is pause and read it okay take a look at it is the targeted behavior being reinforced or punished and let me know whether or not the type of punishment or reinforcement whether it be positive or negative okay all right let's move on so we've seen it all the time we go in a grocery store we hear a child having a fit having an absolute fit screaming crying hollering sometimes they throw themselves on the floor how might you stop your child from screaming if you had a child screaming in the grocery store? Would you use corporal punishment? Or would you um, use a timeout method? What exactly would you do? Think about it and I'm probably going to create this for a discussion board and have you put your thoughts there. All right, moving on. So what I want you to do right now is just note the consequences are the heart of operant conditioning, okay? And then when we're talking about classical conditioning, the consequences, they're kind of irrelevant because Pavlov's dogs, they still got to eat whether they salivate it or not. But when we're talking about operant conditioning, here is voluntary and um, a person would voluntarily perform the behavior, which the, then that would be the operant and it's gonna produce a consequence. And that'll be either through reinforcement or punishment. So think of it like this, reinforcement strengthens the response, making it more likely to recur. Whereas the punishment is gonna weaken the response and this is gonna make it less likely to recur. Here's another type of slide that I'm not going to really go over because it's an assignment type thing, but it's, it helps you to practice what I would like for you to do um, in each of these examples. Do decide whether or not the situation would be classical or operant conditioning. And once you've been able to label it, for example, if you say that the situation um, or the vignette was classical conditioning, then I need you to say what's going to be the unconditioned um, stimulus, what would be the unconditioned response, what would be the conditioned stimulus, and what would be the conditioned response. And then if you decide that it's operant conditioning, then you need to be able to say whether or not it's going to be positive or negative reinforcement or positive or negative punishment. Okay. 
this gives you practice as i told you sometimes all these terms can kind of get discombobulating but if you practice you'll start to get it all right and of course we have more practice for you to do so uh using reinforcement and punishment what i want you to be able to do is determine if uh, reinforcers or punishers are going to be used at your workplace or here in school um, do you think that they're being applied correctly what type of reinforcers would you like to um, see being used at work for example so and in terms of talking about punishment punishment remember it has to be effective uh, and it needs to be clear, direct, immediate, as well as consistent. Uh, this is not really always going to happen in the real world. So it's extremely hard to be able to do. But think of it like this. Police officers cannot stop every driver every time they speed, right? So and to make matters worse, when the punishment is not immediate, during that delay, the behavior is more like than likely going to be reinforced on a more partial schedule which makes it more resistant to extinction, okay? So you need to think on those lines and how can we fix that? Think about gambling. Um, remember, because it's intermittent, it's gonna be more resistant to extinction. So someone who has a gambling addiction would be having big struggles, right? All right, so just take a look at those things. Make sure you're reading that up in that section and I will say we can move on forward. This will probably have some more information in terms of the assignment. So actually, I'm going to stop this right here for cognitive social learning. We'll pick back up in part four. So continuing with cognitive learning, another of Collier's uh, chimps this one was he was an intelligent little guy named sultan um, and he was put in a similar type of situation as we discussed this time though there were two sticks that was available to him and the banana was placed even farther away too far to reach uh, with a single stick so sultan seemingly he kind of lost interest in the banana but as he continued to play with the sticks he kind of later discovered that he could take the two sticks and interlock them together that he would instantly now have a longer stick that would be able to pull that banana to him so kaya he kind of designated this type of learning as insight learning because some of the um internal mental events that occurred he had actually <clears throat> could only uh, describe as insight and it went on between the presentation of the banana and the uh, use of the stick to be able to retrieve that banana. Now like Collier, Edward Tolman, uh, he kind of believed that previous researchers underestimated animals' cognitive processing as well as cognitive learning and he took note that when it was allowed to be able to roam aimlessly in an experimental maze with no food reward at the end, that rats would seem to develop a cognitive map, so to speak, or a mental representation of that maze. So to be able to test this idea of cognitive learning, Tolman allowed one group of rats to aimlessly explore a maze with no reinforcement whatsoever. The second group he allowed um, was kind of reinforced with the food whenever they would reach the end of the maze. And then there was even a third group that wasn't rewarded during the first 10 days of a, the trial that he did. But starting on the 11th day, he was able to, he gave them the food at the end of the maze. Now, as expected from simple operant conditioning, the first and third groups, they kind of were slow to learn that maze, whereas that second group who got the food at the, uh, and reinforcement at the very end of the maze, they were fast and steady uh, and constantly showed improvements. However, when the third group started receiving reinforcement, again, they got it on their 11th day, their learning quickly caught up to that second group um, that was being reinforced every time. 
what this shows is is that these non-reinforced rats had kind of been thinking about building cognitive maps of the area during the aimless wandering that they did um, and their latent learning only showed up when there was a reason for it to display it and that being when the food was being rewarded so what you want to uh, make sure you have a good understanding about is insight learning and that again is the sudden understanding of a problem that implies a solution the latent learning is that hidden learning that kind of happens and exists without behavioral type of signs or um, prompts. And then cognitive maps, that mental image of a three-dimensional space that we as organisms use to navigate. So in addition to classical and operant conditioning and cognitive processes like the insight and latent learning, we also have been able to find out that there's many things uh, through observational learning. So from birth to uh, when we die, we use observational learning and it's really important in terms of our biological psychology as well as our social survival. That being, if you remember, the biopsychosocial model. Watching these others kind of helps us to avoid dangerous situations in our environment. It lets us know how to think and feel, as well as being able to show us how to act and interact socially. Now, according to Bandura, observational learning requires at least four separate type of processes, that being attention, retention, reproduction, as well as reinforcement. So the four key factors, again, as I mentioned, think about it with the child. A child is wanting to become a ballerina. They would need to be able to incorporate these in order to learn. So first is attention. They'll be observing, um, and pretty much this is why teachers uh, would insist on having students watch demonstrations. Um, then it's retention, to be able to learn those new behaviors, uh, as well as start taking notes on how they can use it for themselves to be able to remember what the model is directing and demonstrating. C is now they're going to try to do it themselves, reproduction. So it's being able to imitate what the model has been doing. And then reinforcement, that would come more like when they've got that pattern and dance down and the applause they would receive would reinforce uh, the fact that they did well and that they learned the uh, dance. Think about when you learn a new step. Now, most of us, we all know the electric slide and the cha-cha. Um, and I know I'm going way back. And there's one that's out there right now. And for the life of me, I can't recall the name. But it sounds like a Western and you're doing a two-step. Um, but think about that same process, how you learned it. You watched everybody doing it. You kept watching. You started taking notes of the footwork that they were doing. You then started doing it yourself and started practicing. And then your reward was you was able to get along in that line with everybody else and do it well or better than everybody else. So that's observational learning. Now let's look at the biology of learning. So admittedly, um, it is a big leap when we're talking about rats to humans, but research has been able to show that human, the human brain also responds to environmental conditions similar to like rats, okay? So for example, older adults who are exposed to stimulating environments, they generally are gonna perform better on intellectual uh, and perceptual tasks than those who are gonna be in restricted environments. So things you wanna take note to seeing is that when we utilize the environment, it helps us um, in terms of our brains, a thicker cortex, it increases nerve, uh, nerve growth, it helps with our synapses developing and continuing to branch out with the dendrites, and it also helps us improve our test performance. Now, it does create new synaptic connections in the cortex as well as wide network for our brain structures. So, all this learning helps to keep us flourishing. 
Mirror Neurons and Imitation. Now in a series that's been well known, as a well known study, Andrew Metzoff and Keith Moore, they kind of found that newborns could imitate facial movements as tongue protrusions, uh, mouth opening, as well as lip person. Now, I love this part because I used to have fun doing that with my son. And my oldest son, he used to come up with the, he used to do all my crazy looks and faces and it just amazed me. Um, but when we're talking about mirror neurons, just remember it's believed to help us with our empathy as well as imita imitation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You'll see it actually impacts several key areas of our brains. It allows us to be able to identify um, and see how others are feeling besides ourselves. And the thing is, we still don't know just how much our neurons develop through actions of the environment and um, our imitating life experiences. So researchers used classical conditioning to help teach coyotes not to eat sheep. It was possible. They kind of began by lacing freshly killed sheep with a chemical that caused extreme nausea and vomiting in the coyotes that ate the tainted meat. So what happened is eventually those conditioned coyotes, they started running away from the, even the sight or the smell of the sheep. When we're talking about evolution and learning, we're talking about that biological preparedness. And that's going to be those times when it's, a, it's something that's built within us that helps us to associate um, between certain different stimuli as well as responses. Now, when we talked about the coyotes, what I was speaking about is what we call taste aversion. And more or less, that's that negative reaction that's been classically conditioned to a particular taste that would make us feel ill or nauseous. This technique has also been used in terms of weight loss. It's also been used in terms of smoke sensation. Uh, some has been more helpful than for others. Now, <clears throat> Through shaping as well as reinforcement, a chicken can first learn to pull a loop that will be activated by a swinging bat. And later we've been able to learn that it actually would hit the ball. However, instead of running to first base, it may chase the ball as though it was food. But regardless of the lack of reinforcement for chasing the ball, the chicken's natural behavior would take precedence. Now why am I talking about all this? Can a chicken learn to play baseball? We see that there's some uh, possibilities and there's well as some limitations, but this is a biological constraint that's known as instinctive drift. Okay, so these biological constraints are considered to be conditioned responses that helps one to shift from and to uh, our innate responses, what we feel automatically should be done compared to what is being presented to us. And an instinctive drift is that when uh, we kind of move back toward our innate responses, it's going to be conditioned responses that we kind of shift away from and back to what we know naturally. And guess what, everybody? We have successfully completed chapter six, learning. Um, of course, please do use this as much as possible. You can find these two videos on um, online at the Science Central. If not, uh, I can always uh, pull them up if anyone is interested and have them uh, placed on Canvas for your viewing pleasure. We will be getting started uh, shortly on our next chapter, but everybody have a great day.